invite you now to the second panel of the day, mega con satellite constellations and non-geostationary systems with the participation of Sonia Admis as moderator for this session. Sonia is an expert of telecommunications market. She has over 25 years experience, main senior analyst for Latin America since 2014. Sonia is a public accountant. She has an MBA from SEMA University and has developed the executive program for the Tele University in Buenos Aires. Besides, he's an associate professor for PhD courses and Jury of Global Awards of Mobile Congress. In addition, Sonia is a founding partner of Networking of the ICT Girls. <laughs> As panelists, we are accompanied by Christopher Casarulla, head of regulatory affairs. We have web. Christopher has worked with governments, associations, uh, intergovernmental associations, among others. He joined recently Huawei as uh, governmental affairs and regulations affairs for Latin America and the Caribbean. Performed as head of emerging markets, where he advised the largest telecommunications providers by satellite, internet company, telecommunications infrastructure companies, and governments. Laura Roberto, Spectrum Manager and Access to Intel Set Market, responsible globally for the licenses of Tylesat, including the new Tylesat Love Space System, PhD in Electronic Engineering from the uh, Torino Polytechnic in Italy, a broad experience in the industry and academia world in research, author of several papers in radio propagation. Before Telesat, she worked for Imarsat, British Telecom and NASA, and the Vitorino Polytechnic. Fernando Carillo, Regulatory Affairs Manager from the Kuiper Project of Amazon. Broad experience in technical aspects, regulatory affairs, policy planning, and spectrum management, as well as uh, coordination and licensing of satellites. He performed for 19 years in the regulatory authority of telecommunications of Mexico, and then he moved to the private sector in the US, working from EchoStar and Hughes, currently for Amazon. Manager of regulatory affairs of Kuiper Project. Chris Ivers, CEO, CEO in ASD Space Mobile. Chris, commercial director, Space Mobile, with over 26 years of experience at a high level in the telecommunication industry and satellites. Recently, he was vice, Secretary Vice President, Manager General of Commercial Regions for Globcom and currently. Uh, currently as Vice President for Land Solutions of Eagle and Senior Vice President of Governmental uh, of AMC. So I, I leave you with this very interesting panel and with our moderator, Sonia Artis. Hello, good morning, good uh, and many thanks to Annie, National Agency for Spectrum for your invitation. I, we, we believe these events are quite interesting with the latest relevant topics around spectrum. And bueno, ahora es que le quiero dar este, las palabras a Laura. Right now, we are with Laura Roberto, she's a spectrum and management director from Telesat. So, Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sonia. Apologies for uh, for the delay. And before before I start, uh, I wish to thank uh, A&E very much for uh, for inviting Telesat and myself, and for the opportunity to briefly introduce uh, the new Leo system from Telesat, uh, Telesat Lightspeed, uh, and also address some of the benefits it can bring to the region, and also some of the challenges that this non the Telesat Lightspeed and also other non GSO systems may may encounter. Um, so, if I may. Go to the next slide. So, just a brief description of the system. I will not go into the details. Um, Telesat Lightspeed is a highly innovative global LEO network. It uses two different types of orbits a polar orbit for truly global coverage and an inclined orbit to allow focusing most of the capacity where we expect the demand to be, which means around the low and middle latitudes. Um, the overall number of uh, satellites for the constellation is less than 300, uh, which is, makes it a constellation, of course, but not a mega constellation like uh, others may be defined. 
Uh, also in terms of gateways, uh, we I believe we need less gateways than other uh, um, similar systems. In fact, we are planning to start a global service with only 18 gateways um, globally around the world. And this is uh, thanks to the, a number of factors, including the availability of optical inter-satellite links, uh, regenerative uh, onboard processing and uh, hopping beams. In fact, the beams can hop very quickly um, at a rate that is essentially invisible to, to the user, but such that basically um, every satellite can cover the entire field, uh, field of view by this methodology. Um, the altitude of each satellite is around 1,000 kilometers, which makes it approximately 35, kilo, um, 35 times closer to Earth than Geo. And this essentially leads to uh, fiber-like, uh, fiber quality, low, low latency. The spectrum that is planned to be used is in KA band for both the gateways and the user terminals. Uh, there is a plot on the slide if you can see it. But the, the, the main um, point is that uh, potentially the system can use up to 4 gigahertz of spectrum. Uh, and this allows uh, for um, user links that can go from a few megabits per second to multiple gigabits per second. So overall, uh, an unprecedented amount of, um, of capacity. Um, another aspect I would like to mention that uh, the availability of inter optical inter-satellite links uh, also add significant, significantly to the resilience of the network uh, because um, the, now the mesh is such that there is no more any single point of, um, of failure. And applications are, I would say, the usual for mobile and fixed terminals for enterprise, government, maritime and aeronautical. Um, if I may, I would go to the next slide, which addresses some regulatory aspects that are relevant to light speed, but I believe not only to, to us. Uh, the first is the lack of a regionally harmonized and streamlined framework for Earth Station in Motion and also for ubiquitous visas. Um, and this addresses aspects such as, for instance, blanket licensing and facilitation in the circulation of terminals. Um, it has already been mentioned that, for instance, a draft recommendation is currently being uh, developed uh, in CITEL and, um, and it was also discussed in the last uh, PCC2 meeting. Another aspect uh, is the issue of uh, spectrum fees. Um, I don't have any specific example in mind, but uh, in some cases, uh, fees are spectrum dependent, in other words, depend on the amount of spectrum, and they were designed, defined when a um, system used to use a few megahertz of spectrum, but now they can use a few gigahertz, so the multiplying fa factor is much uh, bigger, and in some cases they do need, they may indeed need revising. A third aspect is the requirement for landing rights, which is quite peculiar to the Americas, um, as telesat and in general as the satellite industry, we are uh, inclined toward um, um, what is called also an open sky approach. But uh, um, in general, the requirement of, for landing rights can indeed delay and in some cases also impede the service provision in the sense that in some cases it can take months and months to, to acquire the landing rights. And by then, uh, the commercial opportunity, there can also be a social opportunity in the sense that uh, some of the services, again, are at the end for, for the customers is gone because the, the, the provider has moved elsewhere with their interest. And to this extent, uh, Telesat really wishes to congratulate uh, Colombia um, because, again, in the last... Uh, um, consultation from the Ministry of Information Technology and Communication um, really addressed these three aspects uh, of um, blanket licensing, reducing the spectrum fees, and also addressing the possible removal of landing rights. So we really believe uh, that is really setting a leading example also for other administrations. The last point I would like to briefly mention is Agenda Item 116 for non-GSOism in KA Band. Um, there has been a lot of work in the past two conferences for GSO easing in KA band. And as Telesat, we believe that the technical, operational, and regulatory provisions for non-GSO easing 
should be similar to those applicable to for GSOEs and to the extent possible. And this also because of the similarity of the user terminals, of course, and also not to create uh, an unnecessary uh, competitive disadvantage for uh, uh, services that at the end of the day are similar for, um, uh, for the user. Um, another important aspect that I would like to address is uh, the aspect of uh, global connectivity and as Telesat we strongly believe uh, that is uh, of paramount importance uh, that there is uh, an inv a governmental involvement in defining uh, policy and facilitating uh, uh, connectivity to remote and rural areas. Um, in, this, in this respect, uh, uh, Telesat has put in place a partnership with the government of Canada towards the provision of um, satellite backhaul to terrestrial mobile operators via Telesat Lightspeed and also towards eliminating the digital divide. And, uh, and also in relation, for instance, to the, to the provision of backhauling, I would like to emphasize uh, what, I, what we see as a, a strong synergy to be put in place between satellite and terrestrial operators rather than a possible confrontation. I, I strongly believe that we both need each other to, to, to provide the services that are, that are required. Um, and with this, I would really leave with uh, some takeaways uh, that uh, Telesat Lightspeed will provide much needed capacity with flexibility, low latency and revolutionary economics in the region. We believe that uh, uh, governmental support for rural connectivity will be, will be of the utmost importance for achieving universal connectivity. We also believe that there is a need for a streamlined and harmonized regulatory approach in the region for the timely deployment of novel services. And to this extent, we warmly invite administration to support the revision, the possible revision of domestic regulations when needed to adapt to new services, to support the development of an harmonized regulatory framework in the region, and also to support the studies under agenda item 116 towards a, so, a successful solution for this agenda item, similar to the one for geostationary easing in the same frequency band. And with this, uh, I wish you, I wish once again to thank you all very much. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Laura. Bueno, excelente. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, in the presentation. I think that it is something to work collaboratively, like the case of Canada to reduce the digital gap in the rural areas. I think this is very important. And I, and I think these things that you highlighted in the issues that you work, harmonizing the spectrum. And then we had there in respect of the WRC and all the, the regulatory affairs for all these matters, as well as the prices of the spectrum, which is also a key issue with this. And with this, thank you very much. And now we're going to hear from one of the most uh, interesting issues, which is new, new, well, not that new, the projects of Amazon and it's the project of Gulpier. And then we have them there. Who is the one accountable for Latin America? So very much at the expectation to know the latest matters in respect of what Amazon is doing with the issue of the satellite services. So Amazon, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. This is Fernando Carrillo. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, I'm going to share my screen. Yes, I'm going to see, I'm going to try it. I don't know why it doesn't allow me to, um, it doesn't say that I have to unconfigure my system for Zoom. That's the first time that I've had that request. Can someone can project it for me? We'll see, let me check if we do manage. Um, let me give me a second, yeah? We're going to check for a second, okay? I am in Argentina. And we are transmitting from Colombia. So it is a, an international coordination. I mean, the issues, if, if you could pass the slide, send us the slides, and then we, the organizer have it over there. I mean, yes, 
they have not received it, they are saying. See if we could facilitate. Uh, I don't know if, if we actually go to the guest speaker. Yes, let's go to the next speaker and then we come back. Um, so I am going to um, progress with the next uh, speaker, which is a very uh, novel service. I would like to uh, present Chris Ivory. Is the commercial uh, for of space AST space mobile? It's a new system, and it actually promises to be a great contribution in what satellites can do. So, Chris, the floor is yours. Great, Th thank you very much, uh, Sonia and uh, and Anne for uh, allowing me to participate in uh, in this uh, this uh, great panel. Um, and it's an honor to uh, to to be able to present uh, myself and my company AST Space Mobile and the benefits that uh, we can provide for connecting the, the unconnected. And so I assume everybody can see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect, great. So AC, we are a, a, a uh, satellite uh, designer and manufacturer. We are in the process of testing and building a low Earth orbit satellite constellation that will enable direct connectivity to standard mobile devices. So this means, our satellites are equivalent to a space-based cell tower, and there is zero modifications required to the, uh, to the mobile device. So every mobile device in Latino America that, is, uh, that, that are, are being used today will be able to connect to, uh, to our, uh, to our uh, satellites. This means no SIM card change, no firmware, no software, no app is required. And our objective is in direct partnership with the mobile operators is to provide, is to extend their already licensed spectrum, their nationwide spectrum to provide cellular broadband services uh, to the area, to the unserved areas or to the unconnected in, uh, in each one of their, their countries. The objective, so we work very closely with, in partnership with the, with the licensed mobile operators to complement their existing terrestrial infrastructure and to fill the gaps of where they do not have coverage today to provide affordable broadband, uh, broadband uh, services. And we, we will be supporting 2G, 4G, and uh, and also and also 5G, but it's very important to to you know, to, to stress that this is that our our go to market is always through the mobile operator. We do not compete with the mobile operator. They uh, the the uh, the end users will uh, access the space mobile will purchase the space mobile service through the already licensed mobile operator, and it will be market based pricing. Even in low ARPU markets, where it could be a dollar, two dollars, three dollar ARPUs, we have a low enough cost base that we can enable affordable cellular broadband service into the areas that are that are unconnected. Um, just a little bit about our our company and, and funding. We we currently are a, a publicly traded company on the Nasdaq. To date, we've raised five hundred and eighty million dollars. Um, and also in partnership with uh, our key investors of Vodafone, Rakuten, American Tower, and also Samsung. And just on the right-hand side, these are some of our uh, our MNO partners uh, that we work uh, that we work very closely with, and that we we cannot provide the service in a country without a uh, a licensed mobile operator. We we are a wholesale model, and our customers would be the uh, be the, the, the mobile uh, operator in each, uh, in each market. Just to give you an idea of, of what our, our launch plans are, we will be launching our second, uh, uh, our second uh, pilot or, pro or, or test satellite. Uh, uh, it's on target for March of, this, uh, of next year um, on a, with SpaceX. That, this, this satellite will enable direct connectivity and direct testing to standard mobile devices in a number of markets. We actually are, are uh, hopeful, hopeful to uh, test this in a number of markets in Latin America. 
And then we are will be uh, begin our launch of our first uh, phase one service, which will have uh, coverage along 49 countries along the equator, particularly in Latin America will be Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and, uh, and Brazil. Um, and with, for, with commercial availability in 2023. And then we complete our global coverage in, in three additional phases, uh, completing a, hundred, a total of 168 satellites by uh, 2025. And just to give you an idea of, of the, the system architecture, and then also I want we'll, we'll, we'll address some of the, the key regulatory items that uh, we find uh, will be very important in order to have the space mobile service uh, to be one, one way of helping close the, the digital divide for affordable uh, broadband connectivity is that the satellite is a, it's a very large phased array uh, antenna that does enable direct connectivity to the uh, to, to the mobile device. We do this in a, in a we have a number of different ways and methods of being able to uh, to manage to, to, to self interference management processes so that we are not we are not creating any type of interference for the existing ground uh, uh, terrestrial network and also for cross border. Uh, and it, you know, ensuring that we are not interfering or anything over over cross border, and then the 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 UEs or the mobile devices connect directly to the satellite, and then through a QV band feeder link into in country or in region gateways, where they uh, connect directly to dedicated E node Bs, BTSs, or G node Bs, and to the uh, our MNO uh, partner core network. So you can see we are purely a, 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 a space-based cell or uh, radio head uh, or cell tower, and that it's really just a bent pipe or a mirror is what the, the, the satellite is enabling uh, the, the enabling our MNO partners to extend their coverage into areas that they do not uh, have today. And, and I'd like to, to the, the, even say what Laura, what Laura from uh, Telesat was saying about uh, key regulatory items that are important in, in order to, um, to enable new technologies and innovative technologies. Certainly one, to, one is the, the landing rights. I, I absolutely agree with Laura is, ha is having flexible landing right requirements that uh, embrace innovative technologies that will enable the, the affordable broadband services to be in the, to, to help connect the unconnected. And those are some of the policies that we would really love to work with, uh, with ANE and all of the other regulators in the, uh, in the region, we've already started this, is how can we uh, work together to enable innovative technologies that are good for the citizens that are providing affordable broadband uh, services. Thank you, Sonia, that's, uh, that's all I have. Chris, thank you very much. It's really an interesting model. And as you say, it's to really have a significant framework change, a change of mind. You don't have to change your device. You just change there. So we're actually hoping that you launch this quickly in Latin America. That is our wish. Now I'd like to hand over the mic. Once again, we're going to see another perspective, one of the new players of the satellite service, which is Juan Webb. And I'm going to give the word to Christopher Casarubias from Market Access. So Christopher, um, the floor is all yours. So Christopher, please tell us as to how OneWeb is evolving after the, all of the changes that you had last year. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. Good afternoon for those words in the afternoon. I don't know about Market Access and my colleagues there. I am the boss of regulatory services. Yes, I thought, well, he said, that's what it said here, but I thought you were there. I know that I work with, with regulatory efforts. I was a bit surprised. Yes, it's better to clarify, and that's what I wanted to clarify this, that I work is in regulatory mode. We work hand in hand with them, but I'm part of the regulatory here. So thank you for the introduction. You you speak of this panel as, the, as a topic in vogue, and uh, there are some discussions that don't go tied really to the satellite systems. So it's excellent to have this option here of having satellites. And if you allow me to make a comment from Laura Robertis about the importance of those regulations in Colombia, that very probably it is 
an avant-garde sort of regulation. The only thing that I would wish to add in there is that we await for them to publish it, to see the, the details. And there's a pro, it's a draft project and we want to see those there. We hope that those are, things are ratified, but we still are eagerly awaiting their publication. With that, as you well mentioned, Sonia, there is a financial restructuring process that we want to speak about. We want to mention as to where are we trying to achieve, to get there? If uh, do you have the slides you can project, or please progress? And the technical team is trying to share the slides, but you go ahead and speak off your mind. Well, thank you. All right. So certainly, this this process has been a true learning experience. And since they used the chapter eleven, that we're going to see it in a very novel way. And facing the future, it leaves us in a position of strength. Why so? On the one hand, we have a significant investment, $2.7 billion. Aside from finishing in there, we have new investors with the experience and the credibility necessary to help us position OneWeb as one of the most successful business to business players, where is where we want to locate our firm. As our audience knows, we work in the UK. The UK, Bartik Bal is another investor, has a brilliant history in the sector, and it has knowledge of emerging markets. He's a new investor of ours with Intelsat. We also have a geo operator. And our original investors, they decided to continue to trust our technology and our vision. On the, on the other hand, I want to comment that uh, we have completed our 10th uh, launch in October of this year. And since we, as we re-emerge from chapter 11, there has been 10 launches on an average about a launch every month. That is a brutal sort of working schedule for one web. And we're at the middle of our constellation of the 380 that we have that are about to, to, to get to half of our constellation. I wish to focus a bit on uh, what is a great strength of one web. One, we are an operator that understands international norms, specifically the, the one side of the communication understanding as well as the satellite regulations and nationally, we have actually executed them one by one as they come. And here I would mention something very important, which is the priority that OneWeb has about the majority of the constellations as are mentioned in this panel, about six gigahertz of spectrum of the KU as well as the K-band. On the other hand, uh, what is an, uh, an important modal issue now in the sector is where OneWeb is positioning himself in the last months and actually before the chapter 11. And they have to do with their spaces, precisely the impact and not the major constellation about this. From one web, we are working on the design of our constellation. And then we see um, an orbit that is less, um, less occupied up until we get a robust system, a robust testing system on ground before we launch. And then, of course, we have the technology to respond to any incidents that they may, may come. And then I see that we don't have the slides. Huh? They're not there, are they? We're in slide three. OK. So we're in slide three. OK, great. So here, I'd like to tell you a bit, simplifying terribly our network, both in the side of uh, space uh, segment as well as others. And we have to mention here a total of 650. I don't know that we can call this a mega constellation. We don't. We are not a mega constellation. We're just a constellation. But these satellites are traveling different or in twelve uh, orbits, uh, and then we have in a joint venture with Airbus. And what we have, and this implies really less costs 
uh, a speedier one, and therefore they launch it uh, faster and so on. From the terrestrial segment, we have to have 40 gateways, a bit more than 40 gateways around the world, and number seven in Latin America, and very probably one in Colombia. And we're also having, or we're working with our partners to develop a, a range of the users that actually satisfies the markets and so on, which is not the same uh, uh, internet uh, user for a, a terrestrial backup or something like that. And well, once again, in as far as the spectrum, just to emphasize that we operate with a priority in the band, in the K band and the count band. So next slide, please, Sonia. We were speaking about the topic of the issue and in reality continues to be from the standpoint of the diagnosis of Latin America, more than a third of the population still living in digital poverty. And in our industries and new constellations, we are seeing an improvement of our network and our equipment in the commitment with responsible practices. And we're talking about the management of the space and also the flexibilizing of the business model. We in one web, we want to change those decisions about this digital divide. It's actually very costly. And we have of these digital communications, like in these cases that we have had, but uh, we want that our services from having uh, this democratizing role that we have had, the satellites that we have had of the new systems, that they don't have another option. And aside from that, let's speak of um, these new services as facilitators in the digital transformation in Latin America and the impact that they have on the communities within the next months and so on. And what does this pack? Why are we so optimistic about this role? I think there's three reasons, technological progress that in turn we can associate it with the impact on costs, the launching vehicles that we have, the logistics of putting them there, the very manufacturing of the satellites. In the case of OneWeb, we are manufacturing on average a satellite per year in a Florida plant. And I think that these are far more powerful and they're capable of assigning dynamically according to the demand. So lastly, the user terminals, they still have to do a lot of work until you get them to the point of equilibrium in as far as a price balance and a being adopted in, in a greater amount. And likewise, yes, at the same time, um, the, uh, the, the coming to, to the market as the A, SpaceX that we have in this meeting and the Delta and others competition is always healthy. It's good. I think that it set, has a level in playing field as long as we respect the international and, and national frameworks. It will always be beneficial for the consumer. In the next slide, please. Just to close, and I know that time is since just to conclude. Here I show, as a matter of fact, certain points that my colleague Navarro actually mentioned, which I would not amplify, but yes, I would wish to concentrate rather into this regime that there is a present in the ITU in Article 22 that has to protect the, the geosystems. And from our standpoint, and from the standpoint of many of us, it's a, the very ITU, it's a regime that is approved, that has worked, that we use it broadly internationally, and it's perhaps the best tool available. Likewise, for the coordination, there is still a solid mechanism that is clearly established based on coordination and good faith, and it will not need to be modified at the ITU. The last point, and looking into the future is to speak about the industry, how the industry is actually seen as the next uh, wave or the next bands of interest for new services and for the emerging systems, the 4C and the like, and, so, and it's the Q band. 
and they are recently in certain applications in the US where they had more requests of what they were going to do in these nine satellites that they're planning to launch. This is the interest that they have in those bands. And we'll continue to speak with the regulators in Latin America in order to um, give them some orientation as to why those bands are interested and what business models can there be? What are we thinking so that we can next use that? With that, I am just very grateful to you, Sonia. I'm grateful to the ANE for the invitation and just all too ready to continue to have a conversation as to what we have there. Thank you. Um, Christopher, it's actually great news that you're progressing after this chapter 11 and this fact that you are manufacturing, I said a satellite per year and it was a satellite per day, what they were doing before in a, in a year, now you do it a satellite per day in your Florida installation, so on, so on. Now we're going to go back to Fernando and Fernando now can share everything and we're going to have the best for last if you allow me that flattery and not to offend anyone else. I mean, and then, so it's your, all yours now, Fernando. I think your system is now working. Now I'm going to try and share my screen. I hope all the tech things are polished. Can you see my screen? Great, we can, yes, great. Since we have it full screen, is that it? Yes, yes, that's excellent, all right. Well, thank you very much, Sonia, and thank you, Annie, and for the ministry, for the invitation. I've been very happy in here. I have already participated in this Congress uh, quite a few times with different uh, hats. And then we have them, that we have them there, and we have them in Mexico as a part of queues and so on, and very recently as the part of the Amazon team of the Piper group. And then we see how we, why Amazon is coming into the business and in this scenario and so on from we have there and then and to have a system the, the, this one that actually provides a broadband and then we have uh, the ones that we qualify there as a, a medium constellations it's more than three thousand satellites and the idea is actually to have this broadband service to uh, connect so that normally we don't have that service um so what really, I mean, what, what are we trying to see with Kuiper? I mean, Kuiper is actually trying to have a system there like many high performance satellite system. And the idea is actually to deploy, let's just say a gradual deployment in different orbital plans with different inclinations pursuant to, to having a flexible system and a coverage system trying to cover the great majority of the population, the global population. Our designs allows us to have a, a, a geographical coverage, high performance, and the idea is to have service plans that we have accessible uh, precisely to, to those who wish to have that service where there are no other opportunities. And that is the reason why Amazon thinks that in these systems that we need to participate, that we need to help everyone, one operator is never going to solve all these things. We're seeing here the digital gap, as you can see, it's dramatical, the digital divide. We can see just how dear this is there of the, of the, 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 the need that you have a broadband, especially in certain regions of the world. We can see clearly the African continent uh, and Southeast Asian, the lack of service there. Also in Latin America, uh, and then even though in the areas of, that do have some coverage, there's still a lot of population measured in the millions without a true opportunity of having a, a broadband coverage. So let's just see the reason why Amazon believes that we do have an obligation, perhaps not an obligation, but yes, the mandate, a mission, yes, to help in closing this divide like in all these systems that my colleagues in Telesat and OneWeb and I and our AST and the like, and we're focusing on different segments, but we are having HST, actually we're trying to get directly to the homes, to this, but obviously we need to coverage small firms, small businesses, also uh, public utilities of health, of education, emergency services, transport services, and telecommunications, 
in this aspect, it's actually very important speaking of 5G and everybody wants 5G. Everyone thinks there's everybody wants a 5G, but however, we want to say for 5G to be a reality, there must be a matter that is something that is far more complex than just a terrestrial network and so on, so that we can have this architecture. We have to speak of backbone, and I think that we think that there are many satellite systems of low orbit and we're going to have their opportunities. And this is one of the segments that we wish to cover precisely for terrestrial services, in this case of cellular architecture, so that we can actually have 5Gs everywhere. The Kuiper architecture is actually very similar to any satellite system. We have a segment that is a satellite there that in our case is actually, we're going to mention a bit more of the orbital characteristics. We have the satellites. We bring them down to Earth and we do it in KA band and we do telecommand sense. Then we have a terrestrial segment with master terrestrial uh, stations that we know about. And then we have a DTC, then we have the points of presence. And so that that's where we have like all the fiber optics and we have all the connectivity. And eventually we have the, the cloud services, internet services. And we have on the other side of the segment, we have the users there that obviously, as we showed before, it's going to help the different segments of this uh, users. Residential and also to telecommunications and the home. So I'm done very quickly. I have limited time, I know. Excuse me for being so quick. And this is the basic system. And this is the Kuiper system. We have between 3,236 satellites in three different uh, we call them strata, or they call it in, 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 the, in English, they call shells and crusted. The best way to translate there, it's actually altitudes. I mean, we have them in different stratas. We have 590 kilometers, 610 and 630. And then we have of almost 30, 42 degrees and so, and we need to cover and so on to cover the latitudes of the 56 degrees north and then we go to the south and then we can hit 95% of the uh, world's population. And then you have the numbers on the, the frequencies. I'm not gonna read one by one, but that's what we're going to do. But first we use the KA band for all type of links for the service, the users, as well as gateway, as well as telemetry and commands. Something that is very curious because the Kuiper systems were going to go from the poles towards the equator. Uh, each one of the clusters of the strata is going to, or, or, or the, the shells are going to do on the different latitudes that we have there, that these orbits have, and they're going to have coverage as you can show them in these tables. The first stage is gonna cover the latitudes of north and south. The second is going to do the latitudes more towards the equator. And the third one, in the third stage, we're going to go everything that is what is on the equator stages four and five is actually just to add up some more people. Our stations, our user stations, they're parts of, are developed by Kuiper. Here, the inventive capacity that Amazon has plays a key role. Here, we have very small units. They're actually going to be of 30 centimeters, 12 inches in diameter. They're just an antenna, like the majority of the the systems that actually be oriented by software. So we're speaking here of uh, arrangements of phase as uh, they're known sometimes and they're going to be tracking the satellites in their specialty. So the maximum capacity of these user ones are the other type uh, of the corporate ones that we have there. And then they're going to have 400 megahertz there in the K-band. So uh, then we have, I know that we're going fast, but I think we did it there. And then we have there for a few minutes that I have, I am at your service and then we have there. Thank you very much. Great, Fernando, thank you very much. And we still have to be very intrigued here as to how the service would work. And we know that we have some of these services that, that we do there of Mexico, Chile. And then I don't know if this is going to be more economically, more expensive. Is there going to be any reference as to how much would the services cost? Does anyone have any debt, any indication? And no one knows anything about prices. The question is for me. 
Yes, it's for you. How much would it? No, no, no. We don't have prices yet. You can't say anything yet. Uh, speak of this price of this but i don't have that information but believe me it's going to be good and cheap good 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 that's very good to know and it's amazon always thinking in customers and there's and we're hoping that way that's true we always think of customers and we hope to have services like that truly it's been really interesting all the presentations and uh they have been uh, having a view of to how they're actually facing them the expectations then in the different companies and really truly we are actually with time covered. So I would like to simply say thank you very much to all guest speakers and so on who have been very thorough the presentation. And we do excuse us ourselves for some technical glitches that we have had, but I think we have been following through. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to Annie. And then I hand over the mic to the coordinators.